All right, we're live on YouTube. Now we're live on Facebook. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Way to Health. Today we're talking about narcolepsy, which is not a really super common condition, but for those it affects, it's it's pretty damaging and disabling. And we're joined by Kathy. Good morning, Kathy. How are you? Good morning, everyone. I'm just going to move my cameras a little bit. Here we go. So, Kathy, what are your thoughts on narcolepsy? Where did you want to start? Well, can you give us a quick overview of it? Because, I, I mean, when you hear the word, you think sleeping sickness. Okay, that's it. People fall asleep. Right, right. And you're telling us that it's totally, what, autoimmune and has to do with the brain? That's the current thought, that there is an autoimmune pathology with narcolepsy. It was actually first suggested, I believe, in the 1980s where, and I think a good thing for me to pause right there is to say, when we talk about genetics and a lot of the genetic discoveries that have gone on, what we're realizing with so many of these neurological conditions, autoimmune conditions, is that the susceptibility genetically is actually from an immune standpoint, not as much like a direct gene causing one problem. So researchers started seeing even back in the 1980s, that narcolepsy patients had this polymorphism of one of their HLA DQB1 genes, I believe is what it's called, 0602. Fancy you number. That out. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. And I'm not a morning person I was able to say. That. I, I, I got that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So basically, they found these polymorphisms within one of what's referred to as the HLA genes, human leukocyte antigens. It's basically how our body recognizes self versus non-self. You see this like in ankylosing spondylitis. You see it really on almost all autoimmune conditions. There's an HLA characterization to it. That's actually for like celiac disease, Kathy. They have an HLA test. So they start seeing this pattern with the HLA uh, polymorphism. And then in the late 90s, I think it was 1999, they started discovering that one of the chemicals in the brain was uh, not being produced that's important for wakefulness. And they thought, well, maybe there is an association with this HLA issue. And researchers and sleep specialists, the world's foremost sleep specialists, they were going back and forth on this saying, well, is it autoimmune? Is it not autoimmune? And then, there, am I jumping ahead, Kathy? Am I going past no, some of the questions? No, no, you're, okay. you're good. And so then in 2009, with the H1N1 flu that many of you will remember known as the swine flu, <clears throat> and the public health protocols to prevent the swine flu, researchers, researchers saw in Sweden a dramatic increase in the prevalence of narcolepsy. And what they deemed was that somehow the body fighting that flu virus led to an autoimmune issue, hence why they saw narcolepsy spike up in the year after that. So that's how we know it's autoimmune. Okay. And what is this chemical that they're missing? Or orexin. Or yeah. Orexin, orexin, and orexin and also that's... known as hypocretin. Okay. And mm -hmm. what does that do in the brain then? So orexin slash hypocretin is a peptide. Uh, many of you are hearing about peptides now, peptide therapies. Peptide mm -hmm. therapies are being used for regeneration, for growth. A lot of athletes are using them. So um, if you're into international athletics, you may know that like the Russian athletic team was disqualified in 2016 from competing in Rio. And one of the things that the doping agencies found was that they were using peptides for recovery. Well, anyways, this peptide, orexin, is secreted in the dorsolateral hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is deep in your brain. But the orexin, I'm bringing up the brain model now, Kathy. The orexin signals down into the brain stem to an area called the locus ceruleus. The locus ceruleus is a cluster of neurons that then produce norepinephrine, largely, that go back up into the brain, also goes down into the spinal cord for pain inhibition. So what researchers found was what, basically they were looking at narcolepsy patients and they were doing uh, cerebrospinal fluid studies where they're injecting a needle into their back, 
pulling out the cerebrospinal fluid and looking for rexin, they found that the rexin was really low. And from that, they deemed that then the locus ceruleus is not going to send enough norepinephrine, think of it as adrenaline, it's actually noradrenaline, into the cerebral cortex to wake you up. We need a certain amount of adrenaline, noradrenaline specifically, to do that. So that's what they found. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, like in my case, I just have way too much adrenaline, so I have a really hard time sleeping. Um, <laughs> there you uh, go. That's a good example. I always turn this around to myself of what, right. what's going on. Uh, but, uh, if it's just the orexin that we're we're lacking, mm -hmm. can, and this everything I read said this is pretty much a lifelong situation. There's no real cure. Uh, a lot of times with an and uh, uh, autoimmune stuff, mm -hmm. we find different supplements and things that we can use to supplement those things in the brain. Is there nothing like that for narcolepsy? Unfortunately, not at this point. I believe there are trials trying to figure out how to get an orexin compound into the brain or some method of delivery. But based on what I've read, as of the most current research, I do not believe that's commercially available at this point in time. Okay. So everything with caffeine or antidepressants or even amphetamines mm -hmm. to keep these people awake? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that actually is a treatment with the amphetamines okay. or like the Adderall type medications. Um, more, most of you would think of them as like ADHD meds. And those are commonly used for people who have hypersomnolence or narcolepsy. Um, and they can have varying degrees of success. <laughs> But it seems like narcolepsy patients, and there's two different types of narcolepsy. One is with cataplexy and one is without cataplexy. Cataplexy is basically where they just like, you know, you lose muscle control and you, you fall down. Um, so with cataplexy, I believe is narcolepsy type one. Without cataplexy is narcolepsy type two. Anyways, yeah, there's no orexin medication available yet. Okay, so what other antibodies are associated with narcolepsy? What other antibodies? So that's a really interesting topic. And on that point, the other antibodies associated with narcolepsy seem to be GM antibodies. And we're getting some questions coming in, Kathy, so I'll probably circle around okay. and answer those. But GM antibodies are referred to as gangliocide antibodies. And researchers have said, okay, so with narcolepsy, we know that there's this HLA antigen issue, the HLA DQB1 thing we we're talking about. Um, it's not an antigen, it's basically your predisposition genetically for there to be an autoimmune trait. And then we know that, you know, there's a lack of orexin producing neurons in the hypothalamus. And we know that the flu H1N1 specifically seemed to make this whole condition worse. They went in, they tried to find specific antibodies for narcolepsy, and they can't find them. They haven't found them yet. So then they start doing studies saying, okay, well, if we can't find the exact antibodies, maybe other co-antibodies that you'd see in other autoimmune diseases are there. And so they've really dug into this. The main antibody that shows up is the GM antibody, which is the gangliocide antibody. Gangliocide antibodies are really interesting because they're typically associated with Guillain-Barre, also known as chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculopathy or acute inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculopathy. Again, before 7.40, everyone, I'm saying all this. <laughs> That's a joke because I'm not a morning person. So anyways, um, these conditions known as Guillain-Barre is where your immune system attacks your peripheral nerves. Think of, you, you may have seen like a nerve chart and all these nerves coming out of the spine. And those nerves are covered in myelin, or think of that as insulation. So in Guillain-Barre, the immune system attacks the insulation so that then the nerves don't function. And when the nerves don't function, then people develop, typically if it's the acute form, a sudden paralysis, they may have burning pain, and they basically develop a flaccid weakness. If it's the chronic form, they more present with like peripheral neuropathy, so they have numbness, tingling in their feet, but they also have some weakness. And so the immune cells to the insulation are referred to as gangliocide antibodies. And we're seeing those same antibodies overlap with narcolepsy. Now these gangliocide antibodies, if you dig into the research, actually seem to be triggered by gluten. And so gluten antibodies or somehow eating gluten seems to precipitate these 
GM antibodies. Now, I'm not saying gluten causes Guillain-Barre. <clears throat> Guillain-Barre is characteristically known for being triggered by an infection, but most commonly a gastrointestinal infection. Uh, bacteria like Campylobacter are really common for causing. Campylobacter causes bloody diarrhea if you eat like undercooked fish or not fish, chicken, most commonly, or beef. So somebody gets an infection, what happens? In their gut, they get intestinal hyperpermeability, aka leaky gut. Their tight junctions break down, and that seems to be associated with these ganglioside antibodies. Another thought is, is that because gluten has been shown to cause leaky gut in everyone, Journal Nutrients 2015 lead author, Dr. Fasano, that then maybe those who have a gluten intolerance when they're eating gluten, that can precipitate these GM antibodies. So it's just something to be aware of for narcolepsy patients. I'm not saying that GM antibodies cause narcolepsy, I'm not, but it's curious, it's very curious. It's also curious that the other major condition associated with swine flu as a reaction to it or the public health measure to prevent swine flu was Guillain-Barre. And I don't know if any of you remember that, but a lot of people were concerned about, you know, taking the treatment for swine flu or trying to prevent it. I'm kind of dancing around an issue because I'm not uh, anti that treatment. But basically they found that one of the possibilities was Guillain Brain. I actually have a friend who uh, works in the medical world, and he had a patient with Guillain Barre after they were treated or trying to be prophylactically treated for swine flu. So, pretty pretty interesting. And we our question here is: How about a link to idiopathic hypersomnolence? And I would say I think there is idiopathic hypersomnolence. In my opinion, is on the spectrum with narcolepsy, and some people have idiopathic. Uh, hypersomnolence, idiopathic daytime hypersomnolence, and they never develop narco narcolepsy, but I've seen others who seem to be moving that direction, and maybe they're doing something in their day-to-day -day life with their diet, where I think they've kind of held off the narcolepsy process, but that's just my opinion. So that's what I have to say about that. What else did we have, Kathy? Uh, what other changes do you see in the brain of narcolepsy <clears throat> patients? Oh, yeah. So in the brain, as I was talking about the locus ceruleus, because everything is backwards here. Okay, so locus ceruleus, as I mentioned, is in the brain stem right around the pontine area. What they're seeing is that there's decreased density in the brain stem in the midbrain and the pontine reticular formation in narcolepsy patients. So it seems that without the orexin, that part of our density in the brainstem goes down, which is super interesting. Because now that we have the ability to structurally analyze on a microstructural level the brain with these density studies, uh, we're seeing that that area is kind of like, for all intents and purposes, shrinking, also known as atrophy. So that's what we know from that. Okay, and we know pretty much when the brain atrophies, there's not a whole lot you can do for it, correct? Well... In the medical model, yeah, and that would probably be the uniform prevailing neuroscience opinion on that, we're exploring otherwise. And basically that's kind of one of our ongoing missions right now is to see if we can change density. And uh, we have some early suggestions that that is a possibility if done correctly, but it's still in the early stages. So I cannot come out and say yes. But I think in the future, we're going to see that with the correct therapies, you will see changes in density in the brain, and we'll be able to track okay. that. But it's just so new, folks. So just know when I'm talking about this, like that's a brand new study that just came out showing that there's loss of density in, you know, the pontine and midbrain areas of the reticular formation in narcolepsy patients. There's no orexin compound drug therapy right now that's commercially available and widely used. So maybe if that does come about and then they deliver that and we see changes or somebody comes out and says, hey, you know, we do functional neurology or some sort of functional treatment and we changed this many narcolepsy patients' diets. We did an MRI before and now we're going to do an MRI after and they see a change and maybe that will come out. So. Okay. All right. I like the way we got gluten in there again this okay. week. Okay. <laughs> Always got to get gluten in. Yes. <laughs> uh, it, it is the evil doer uh, uh, so but uh, a very interesting topic i think we learned a lot i don't know if you've got anything else that was pretty much all the questions i had yeah i think it's pretty straightforward i think it's very interesting 
very interesting. And narcolepsy just seems like, you know, it's narcolepsy. People fall asleep all of a sudden. But know that what is it with narcolepsy type 1, with the cataplexy, there's a heavy association with allergic disorders. So also keep that in mind. If For the hypersomnolence folks, you know, do you have any allergies? Do you have seasonal allergies? Do you have a bad food allergy? Do you have a bad uh, whatever, venom allergy? Think of that. With narcolepsy type 2, also there's an overlap with allergies, but there's also a heavy association without the... Did I get that backwards? Yeah, heavy I think I got that. Heavy association with what? I missed that. With narcolepsy type 2, I believe there's a heavy association with allergies, but also autoimmune disorders. So... Okay. Uh, that journal came out of Saudi Arabia, uh, which in that part of the world, narcolepsy is actually less common. Narcolepsy is more common in North, North America than it is in the Middle East, if I can say that part of the world that way. But um, yeah, so I believe that. Is that another indicator of diet, maybe? Yeah, and basically allergies overlaps with both types of narcolepsy, but I think autoimmunity overlaps with narcolepsy type 2 without the cataplexy, but I may have that backwards. So. Uh, so yeah, I think it's interesting. Anytime you have allergies or autoimmune disease, where do you want to look? You want to look at the foods you're eating and how those foods particularly are affecting your microbiome, the 37 trillion bacteria in your intestines. Something to look at because we're just finding that how those bacteria eat the foods, they get imbalanced, they become bad bacteria or, or bad bacteria overgrow, which then leads to breaking off the pieces of molecules or pieces of bacteria that creates inflammation in our body and affects our liver and seems to affect our tolerance for immune system to foreign antigens as well as foreign particles like allergens. So yeah, I think that pretty well covers it, Kathy. Anything else? I'm just going to say whenever I mention allergies and food, people give me the weirdest look. Like I'm really off my tree, but that, <laughs> you know what you're eating to not cause me to be sneezing all the time or have a hay fever kind of stuff. But, I mean, you found that that's really the case. So, people, I mean, there's so many different things that go into all of this. But right. Again, we come back to food a lot. Um, but it is what drives us. It keeps the machine working. So, it can be the culprit in a lot of these instances. Right. Right, right, right. 100%. I agree. And that's so, what I've seen clinically. So, and Hopefully then, everybody learned something this morning, and uh, I think we went through about as much as we could on narcolepsy, and I never thought of it as being autoimmune, but mm -hmm. it's good to know that that's got that, that uh, tie up there. So Yeah. So if you know somebody with narcolepsy, you probably want to share this video, share it out to your friends. Uh, for our YouTube folks, you know, subscribe, share, all that stuff that I'm supposed to say. And... Um, yeah, if you have any other questions about narcolepsy or if you want to give us a topic suggestion, right now, Kathy and I are trying to talk about autoimmune disorders. We're kind of in a little phase of autoimmune neurological disorders, so maybe we'll talk about beyond brain next week. Or if there's something else you want to know about, let us know, and we will discuss it. So thank you, everyone. Appreciate you joining. Okay, we're going to hit end my video here. We're going to hit end there, end.